In July of 2019, the Commandant of the Marine Corps published his planning guidance. In it was a bold vision to modernize the Corps to meet rapidly evolving future threats. This vision is Force Design 2030. As General Berger developed his strategy, he also made some very important assignments, tasking his respective deputy commandants with critical requirements in building the core of the future. One of those was the DC for Combat Development and Integration, who bore the responsibility of not only developing the requirements, but also conducting experimentation efforts to validate concepts, working through plans to divest of capabilities that did not meet future needs, and ultimately creating decision space for the Commandant to make informed decisions on Force Design 2030. That individual spent nearly two years conducting those studies and analysis and burning the midnight oil to get the Corps to where it is today, a strategic naval response force ready to answer our nation's calls and meet and defeat any future threat. It is truly my distinct honor and privilege to have as my guest today the architect of that vision for the past two years, our Corps' 36th Assistant Commandant, General Eric Smith. Sir, thank you so much for uh, making the time to come on the show. But before we dive into uh, the many things that fill that busy schedule of yours, I was hoping you can take us back a few years. Tell us a little bit about younger Eric Smith and why he joined the Marine Corps. Joined the Marine Corps because two things. I had an older brother who was an ROTC Marine option okay. at Texas A&M University. Uh, did not have the money to go to college, so applied for a ROTC scholarship hoping to get one. Uh, they foolishly provided me with one. And so I went down to Texas A&M with the full intent of doing four years and walking away. And I just never got around to getting out yet. But I'm still, <laughs> still thinking about you're, it. You're working on that one. So still so, contemplating. So I guess I, I probably know the answer to my next question. Do you ever envision yourself sitting in the seat as the assistant commandant? Of the no, Corps? no, I never. Uh, I, I thought when I made uh, major, I was stunned, you know, like everybody. You think, holy cow, you know, because as a Smith, you, you assume they've gotten it wrong, gotten yeah. the wrong Smith. But I, I was yeah. stoked to make major. And then you just, life just gets busy and one thing happens and the next thing happens and poof, you know, four years at a time, you're here 35 years later. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Well, again, I, I know I've already congratulated you before, Thanks. but I'm going to congratulate you in this public arena. On, on the current position. Thank you. Can you share a little insight about what it means to be the assistant commandant? What it, what it means to you? It means you're supposed to use your rank to do something good for the junior Marines. So I'm in a position now to try to take what I hear, see, and learn from others and translate that into two functions. One is the kind of the chief financial officer role, if you will, work in the budget. Uh, the other is, I would say, the chief operating officer in that coordinating the staff. Uh, and then also making sure that the commandant has information that he needs for best decision making. And he, he gets that. He gets very candid conversations, candid information from all the deputy commandants. And I am try to make sure I'm the last line of defense that says, this is really what's going on. Or, hey, this doesn't work. I don't think that's a good idea. And I do that, and he takes that uh, information every time and, and calculates it, uh, assesses it. But that's, that's what the assistant commandant does. And I fill in for the commandant um, when he is unable to do an event. I uh, step in with great pride to be able to, to work on his behalf. So sometimes, I, and, and this question may bleed over a little bit, but sometimes I ask folks, tell us what a typical week is like for you. But... Given your schedule from sunup to way past sunset, what's a typical day like for the assistant commandant? It fluctuates a lot because the commandant's schedule will fluctuate, because the Secretary of the Navy's schedule fluctuates, because the Secretary of Defense fluctuates. So everything kind of rolls downhill, uh, and everybody's got a boss. So my schedule will, will, will comprise... I try not to come in here crazy early because the staff tends to come <laughs> in even earlier, so I don't roll in until like 7.30. But I'm the late night guy. I, I am very comfortable being here till 7, 8 o'clock at night. Um, and then I'll go home and the staff always sends me home with homework, uh, packages to review and to work. But it's, it's a combination of uh, working with the staff on, on any number of projects, 
uh, for force design, for talent management, working on uh, the budget, building our program objective memorandum, the five-year defense budget, the FIDIP you always hear about, trying to make sure that what we say we're going to do is actually resourced, mm -hmm. and then making sure that the Marines who actually have to do what we say we're going to do are properly taken care of. I mean, that is a, that's a full day. And then I get to meet with some foreign leaders uh, on the Commandant's behalf or, or on my own, and that is always helpful. I just met the Norwegian uh, Assistant or Deputy Defense Minister to thank them for the work that they did, um, sadly recovering our four uh, fallen uh, aviators, or right. air crew. It, it's those kind of things that require a lot of preparation time and then the execution of that meeting because you don't want to just blindly go into a meeting with an important ally like Norway. What's the best part of your job? What do you love most about your job? And I, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but... No, it's good. The easiest thing is, or the easy answer, you, you get to help individual Marines, like Lance Corporals. You get to help, and I'll be, I'll be very candid. We, we have, uh, and, and I think I can say it because he works at Syscom. We have a, uh, an officer who is a widower mm -hmm. and no dependents left in the house. So the, the, the way that our current setup is, the, if the widow, let's just say it's a female, of an active duty Marine who's, who's a male, let's just say, if that Marine passes away for the next 365 days, we will make sure that no change to, to entitlements, to housing, right, right, et cetera, right. happens because that widow has to transition and, and get a new place to live and everything else. If it's the other way around and the service member who has dependents has a spouse die and he has no other dependents, the next morning he doesn't get those benefits. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Right. So people will actually take my phone call now because I'm the assistant commandant, which is helpful. <laughs> So you hear about a case like that, whether it's an officer or a lance corporal with a bad set of orders, and you can pick up the phone and say, hey, I got a problem, let's fix this. And, and usually it just takes the problem being illuminated. And then the people who are working hard down at CDNI or people working hard at Ledge Affairs or, or in Manpower Reserve Affairs, they'll fix it. And that's the most uh, rewarding thing to me is you can actually use your rank for good and you can help an individual uh, apply for MESEP or uh, or get a warrant officer package because they're deserving. That uh, that part is fun. I mean, that that recharges batteries. So it's back to the people. People it's, first. It's so. always it's it is always people. It's always helping somebody do something. So if if we could, I want to take you back a couple years to your previous hat and and talk a little bit about uh, when the commandant released his uh, his planning guidance. What role did you play at the time? Uh, CD or uh, you were uh, DCCD and mm -hmm. I. So, so there's a little bit of misperception, I think. So I, hadn't, I didn't know General Berger okay. uh, until I went to CD&I. I, to my knowledge, I only met him one time. I met him on uh, the deck of an Australian ship in Guadalcanal wow. on the 75th <laughs> anniversary of the Battle of Guadalcanal. I was 1st Marine Division. Mm -hmm. He was FMF PAC. And I, I know I had seen him. I probably said hello, but had never really, wor certainly never worked with or really even had big conversations with him. So I came to cd and I, and he had a, a vision for, for force design, which mirrored what General Neller had, frankly mirrored what I had as the commanding general of 3MEF, that we're not best organized to deal with the threat right. that I see coming. Right. And that's not to say that previous generations of Marines left us with a, with a mess. That is not true at all. Um, but we, we spent 15 years fighting in the, in the desert, but that wasn't where the future was. So... Uh, Came to work at CDNI and i and offered uh, advice and began to kind of uh, execute the implementation of force design. Um, and if I can, real quickly, that's the other misperception that, you know, General Berger took a, a, a spreadsheet and went into a room and closed the door and, and built force design and said, <laughs> this is what we're going to do. It's just like nothing further from the truth. The, the, the young Turks, if you will, built this. He gave a vision. We got to be ready for a pacing threat. Before 2030 starts, we got to be ready. We got to be organized, trained, equipped, be agile, light, lethal, austere, uh, low signature. Y'all go into a room, y'all meaning a bunch of hard charging lieutenant colonels, colonels who commanded squadrons mm -hmm. and battalions and muse. Tell me what it looks like. Bring me courses of action. So they did. They brought courses of action. He selected one and we started moving. And of course, we've modified that multiple times and we'll modify it again. But um, my role in that was how do you implement that? How do you turn that? vision into actual things, uh, policies that 
create the effect that the commandant's looking for. I believe uh, one of his initial taskers was to uh, look at the legacy systems uh, and perhaps those that did no, no longer had a role in what we were doing. How do we divest that? How do we reinvest that money and capabilities that, uh, you know, that we potentially will need for the future? What do you think was your biggest challenge during all that time? Biggest challenge was we said we would do it within our budget mm -hmm. because that was the right thing to do. The Commandant set, up, set about with a few assumptions, and, and a few of those assumptions were we will get to keep and keep our dollars. I mean, I, I'll be allowed to, to move money from one priority to a higher priority, keep that money, and two, that defense budgets were going to be steady or declining. And people now will say, well, you got a higher defense budget. We did, but inflation consumed it. Things cost a lot more. Everything <laughs> costs more. Um, so those were good assumptions, and they're still valid. And we've been able to keep the dollars that we moved to higher priority things. And tanks is usually the one that comes up first. Um, look, I love tanks. I've used tanks. Uh, used them in Afghanistan at a place called Shirghazi. Um, used them in uh, Ramadi in Iraq. <clears throat> love them. But it's 72 tons of goodness that I can't move in an austere environment in the Pacific where I got to be focused. Um, we, people also say we got 400 tanks. Well, we did in the inventory, but we could only man 162 of them because every tank battalion's got 54. So let's not be, you know, let's get facts right. Plus, the goal of a tank, mission of a tank, is mostly, mostly anti armor, mm -hmm. lots of ways to kill a tank. Right. Right. And for 72 or, or let's just say 80 tons because of fuelers and right, parts, right, right. how much lethality f can I bring for 80 tons? Oh, the answer, I can't say it on this because it's going to be public, right, but right. it would be a cuss word ton, <laughs> you know, a blank ton. Yeah. Um, you, a lot of lethality can come. So when you start saying, hey, we're, no, we're, we're going to make a bold change here, but, you know, uh, fortune favors the bold. It's the motto of uh, out at Third Marines, of uh, Second Battalion Third Marines. But, you know, Third Marines... Yeah. No, but you know, Marines are extremely protective of their environment. Sure. So in a previous life, when I worked a different program that was trying to go from tracks to wheels, we were, you know, they still have a motto that has nothing to do with wheels, but yeah, yes. uh, we, we, yeah. we eventually uh, evolved. So, I mean, I think it's part of our heritage. It's part of our DNA, who change we are. Change is hard, so, and we evolve. Yeah. We always yeah. change. We're yeah. always adapting. And, and if, you're not, if you're not first to adapt, you will not be first to fight. Folks may not realize, but as the deputy commandant for CDNI, and i you're, you're also partially responsible for the checkbook, or at least managing the checkbook, plan and execute the POM process. Yes. How challenging was it to build a budget to meet the modernization objectives of the, of, of the future force? Yeah. Uh, and as things are evolving at a rate that uh, sometimes we can't keep pace with. It's incredibly difficult. Uh, the team at, at Combat Development Integration works very closely daily with uh, the Deputy Commandant for Programs and Resources, the, the comptroller of the Marine Corps, if you will. And it is, it is a wicked problem to take all that you need and then take a, take a fixed budget and make that fixed budget cover all the things you need. And it, it doesn't cover it all. So what you do is you build bathtubs. You start to say, well, I'm going to purchase this in fiscal year 24, this in fiscal year 25. And then that, that very tightly woven plan can change daily because of, uh, and it, COVID came. Mm -hmm. Industry partners shut down. Absolutely. Parts cost Absolutely. more. Uh, supply chains were delayed. And so money that was laid in for 24, there's no parts in 24. So you shift it to 25. But you have to let Congress know what you're doing with the money they gave you because they appropriated it. And so the, the tie-in then to legislative affairs and the Hill is incredibly important and communicating best. And obviously at Systems Command, you know, the folks at CISCOM, you, uh, General Pesagian, you know, the team there actually has to go about doing cost performance schedule and procuring a thing. You actually have to buy a naval strike missile. Uh, and I will say this, uh, free advertising, the, the work that the team at CISCOM did with uh, Strategic Capabilities Office, mm -hmm. with the Rapid Capabilities Office, SCO, RCO, to take a joint light tactical vehicle and turn it into a robotized vehicle and fire a naval strike missile off of it. I mean, that's crazy. And they did it in a year. I mean, that is crazy fast. That is, that is you know, World War II effort 
technology and effort to, in that short of a period of time, to make that happen. That was crazy good. And then we tested it, and people were nervous. Oh, it's not going to work. Well, of course it's going to work. <laughs> it's, a, it's an existing platform yeah. vehicle, an existing platform mm -hmm. missile, and you put them together. And, of course, it worked. The only time it was challenging was because we put an extra safety mechanism in there for a mm -hmm. little bit of a period of time. And once we got it nailed down, we, we went out and shot it and hit a moving ship a couple of times. And uh, totally proven. So crazy good out of Syscom. I think it's incredible because if you take me back 10 or 12 years, I mean, you know, oh. sometimes it takes over a year just to schedule a range yeah. or adjust a shoot. That would have been a five-year program <laughs> several years ago. It actually leads me to a good point. You know, I've, I've had several program managers and other folks on here, and we asked them about the, the gear and equipment. And, and obviously, if you're a program manager, cost, schedule, and performance. You live, breathe, and eat it day in and day out, so you know where your plan is. But i got to ask the assistant commandant, how are we doing? Are we fielding the capability, and are you seeing results? Now that you've kind of sat on both yeah. sides of the fence a little bit. We are fielding because we, do, we don't build requirements. Mm -hmm. right? i got three tours in that building, <laughs> the Davis building, as a requirements guy. Uh -huh. um, and in the past, there was a tendency to build a requirement and, quote, throw it over the transom to Syscom yeah. and say, go figure. Now it's iterative. It's Syscom, it's the lab for concepts, it's requirements, CDD, and it's industry. We're, we're way better. And PMs are doing a great job of actually producing and bringing the capabilities we ask them to find. And more importantly, they're bringing ideas as the program goes. There's a belief that the program manager is wedded to his or her program and they can't see the rest of the world, just their program. I, I do not believe that's true because those PMs, the program managers, will come back and say, hey, there's a better way to do this. We can improve schedule here. We can improve cost here, accept more risk there. And the program manager, there's a belief that, that, that the program manager is, Sarah, is uh, the Terminator, looking for Sarah Connor, <laughs> yeah. never going to come off of, of what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, that's it's not true. You spend a little bit of time at Syscom and you understand that PMs are, one, there's not, there's not a single office mm -hmm. uh, at, at Syscom. It's all open space, so you hear what everybody's doing. It's a, it's a cubicle environment where there's cooperation, collaboration, and graduation. So the, the program managers do cooperate. They do collaborate. They do explain to each other when someone's behind and someone's got an opportunity to leap ahead, ACV, amphib, uh, mm -hmm. amphib combat vehicle, how to accelerate that through a BAE. So I don't, I don't like that criticism. I don't think it's fair. But I think the program managers are doing a great job. It's up to us, guys like me, General Heckel, uh, uh, General Watson, uh, General Mahoney, and then uh, General Austin, to tell a program manager, stop procuring that. Right, right. And guess what? It's a lawful order. They'll actually do what you right. tell them. But if you don't tell them, they're going off their last uh, lawful order, which is get that as fast as you can because there's a Marine that needs it. Mm -hmm. It's a family business. you know. Everybody at Syscom loves Marines. Well, it, it, it's interesting. I, I, it's a great segue because I think uh, acquisition is a team sport, yep. uh, and we have a lot of members on this team. So I, I think first and foremost, uh, Congress, industry. Let's talk about Congress a little bit because I know from personal experience you've spent quite a bit of time over the last two years, maybe even a little bit longer, walking the halls of Congress, building relationships. Can you share with us a little bit about that? Sure. And, and, and your observations of that uh, relationship? Sure. Yeah, I got, I'm, I'm grabbing. Too bad it's on the radio because you, uh, you won't know <laughs> it, but I'm grabbing my, my constitutional, my copy of the Constitution that I keep on my desk. And it's, it's really clear, of course, I don't have my glasses either, you know. But it's, it's really pretty clear. Um, it tells you that who is in charge. It also tells you that Congress shall raise an army and maintain a navy. I mean, it's pretty clear. Words mean something. So, And it's a small book. It's a small book. Absolutely. And so with Congress, people say, oh, you know, you, you're the ACMAC, so it must be all political. I, I reject that because it's not political. Do I deal with politicians? Yeah, because the Constitution says to. It says that they have the power of the purse. So when I go and speak to an authorizer or an appropriator, the two different sides of the, mm -hmm. of the equation, they want to know, what are you about to spend money on? Why do you want to spend money on that? You, so you have to be over in Congress because they own your tax dollars, if you will, for distribution. I mean, that's what the Constitution says. So I spend a lot of time on the Hill 
explaining why we're doing what we're doing, what our cost performance and schedule looks like, uh, both to members and professional staff members. Um, and if you don't do that, you're not doing your due diligence at explaining to the people's representatives mm -hmm. how their money's being spent and is their national defense being insured, which is what the Constitution tells us okay. we have to do. So I do spend a ton of time over there. And I will tell you, there's some real professionals that, that understand everything from hypersonics to artificial intelligence to shipbuilding. Um, they really understand it. And you, you have to be on your toes when you go over there because there's tons of competing interests, especially now with the pandemic, for uh, the people's tax money. So I spent a ton of time over there. Yeah, resources are valuable. So I don't necessarily want to peek behind the curtain and see what their vision is, but uh, you get a, a sense of feeling uh, of support, uh, oh. overall support from yeah. uh, most of the constituency. We I, I would say uh, w without question and unequivocally, I can tell you that the, the committees who I brief, the TALF, the Tactical Air Land mm -hmm. Forces Committee, the Sea Power uh, Subcommittee, the House Armed Services Committee, they support, no, nothing is uniform, right? But, but as a whole, right, yes, they right. support force design, the changes we're making, the things that we're procuring, the talent management piece, the new training and education, they do support it. The staff members support it. It's, I mean, there's, there is no question. And here's how you know, because, and the Department of Defense uh, supports it and Department of the Navy. General Berger has briefed the Secretary of the Navy, Secretary of Defense, and the HASC and SASC. Um, and I've briefed Secretary of the Navy, I have one brief for the SecDef, and I've briefed HASC and SASC on this is what we're doing. The way you know that they support it is we, we internally moved almost $16 billion, billion with a B, like the Elon Musk kind of, yeah. <laughs> you know, real, real money. $16 billion, and we kept every bit of it. Normally, if you move money from one place to another, they'll put it somewhere they'll else. Put it somewhere yeah, else. We kept every bit of it, and we actually got about $1.3 billion more. Mm -hmm. So when people say, put your money where your mouth is, they said they supported it, and we kept almost $16 billion. When I say kept almost, meaning every dollar we moved, we kept. It was almost $16 billion worth, plus we got an additional one3 and it's not easy. I just want to focus on one key point. So, and, and I've been around a few years as well. So, and I've seen a one few. One or two. One or two. I'm not saying you're old. Few. It's like the Big Lebowski. Uh, I'm not saying. I'm not saying you're wrong. Yeah. So. Yeah. But, uh, and I've seen a few commandants planning guidance, and, yeah. and I got to tell you, so a lot of them, you know, the the direction, the guidance, and everything is up front. Yeah. This one was built in a way that it will grow and evolve, and it has evolved over the last couple of years. Because the think, pacing threat is moving. Yeah. It's, it's all yeah. about the threat. And the threat moves every day, every month, every week. That They're evolving. Sadly, normally they're increasing capability. Right. So right. if you don't build something that can pace with the pacing threat, you're just putting a mark on a wall, and then you're checking it once a year, you are going to be behind. Mm -hmm. So speaking of that, let's get to uh, another member of the team, uh, industry. So this next yeah. week, Modern Day Marine will kick off on its uh, new home ground there at uh, the D.C. Convention Center. Obviously a big change uh, from the fields down at Lejeune Hall, but perhaps long overdue change. Way overdue. Uh, what, what's your focus at this event, and what are you hoping our industry partners take away from, uh, you know, spending a sure. few days with us up at, uh, at the convention center? A, a big shout out to Lieutenant General Chuck Schrode, who is now the, the CEO of uh, the Marine Corps Association Foundation, and to Lieutenant General uh, both retired Mark Faulkner, okay. the previous yep. uh, CEO, for having the vision that we, we have to take this to a new level. We have to get a legislative change so that we have this unique, legal, unique relationship. So we don't have to ask Mother May I right. to support our association with a bus, with the band, whatever. Right. So they, they had a good vision uh, and they saw it to reality. So moving it from Quantico up here closer to industry partners, I used to have a joke that I would say, here's, here's where we're going. Uh, you know, the Marine Corps needs the following things. And our focus area, let's just say, is decoys, autonomous uh, systems, and um, I don't know, let's just see those two, decoys and autonomous systems. So if you bring those products, those kind of ideas and things, you get to go in tent one. Right. If right, you bring right. stuff that you want to sell but I'm not interested in, you go in tent two. And tent two is in another zip code yeah. <laughs> that you're going to have to bust to. Um, so I'm, what I'm hopeful, and industry has been very good about this, um, we, we don't want to stifle creativity because we don't have all the answers. The answers lie with Marines, they lie with industry, they lie with Congress. Uh, they, they, they lie 
with our uh, with our veteran Marines. We want industry to read the planning guidance, to read the force design updates, mm -hmm. and to to bring ideas that in their mind, having hopefully talked to CISCOM, talked to uh, Combat Development Integration, they'll bring things and ideas that further and accelerate where we're going with force design. Because it is now about accelerating this, getting it done as fast as you can. So that's what I hope we get out of Modern Day Marine is those industry partners have read and bring us ways to go even faster. And I know that will scare people when they say go even faster. <laughs> you know, we're not sure we like what you're doing at all. Well. The, the folks who control the dollars um, and the operational commanders do like what we're doing. Now, there will be individual changes that we'll have to make, the size of an infantry battalion or whatever. What I would tell you is the operational commanders are demanding these kind of capabilities. And the reason I say accelerate is because if we're going to be very candid, and it's been said in open testimony by the last two PACOM commanders, by 27, China will have the capability to offensively retake Taiwan. Mm. That's been set in an open source. Mm. You can't do incremental changes and, and hope to have something in place maybe by 27. You gotta move now, you gotta move quick. Because what we're trying to do is deter and prevent a war. You don't wanna see what's going on in Russia, in, in Ukraine because of Russia, because of their uh, unhooked attack. You don't wanna see that play out in the Indo-Pacific. So you better move quick and have something that will cause that trajectory to change. And you have to signal to industry what you're looking for in the future because yes. you can't turn, you can't go to Ford or GM and say, I want a six wheel truck, not That's a right. two wheel truck. That's right. And expect to get it tomorrow. It's gonna to take you some time. So, yeah. so, so having said that, I know over the last couple of years, you've spent quite a bit of time on the road visiting yeah. some industry. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts and perceptions? What advice would, uh, do you usually provide them? We, what we need is things that are lighter. Mm -hmm. And we look, industry partners, we know we're giving you a wicked problem to solve because we want it cheaper, faster, lighter, and longer range. Uh, that, that's, a hard, that's a hard thing to do. What I would say is if you're an industry and you are building things that, are, that have low signature mm -hmm. or there's a way to bring a decoy with it that mimics it, that's protection. That are so low signature, that have range, and balance range with size and weight. Well, look, we're an expeditionary force. We have to be light and mobile. So if you bring me something that has massive range, massive capability, but you know it's two 40-foot ISO containers, I, I can't haul that around the Pacific. I need something that fits in a seven ton, fits on a JLTV, like great one, CAC2S, small form factor. Mm -hmm. Really phenomenal work, uh, common air command and control uh, system. I um, saw that thing go from two massive tents exactly. down to a suitcase. It's a suitcase. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. phenomenal. It's been yeah. great work done, frankly, by some Marines who then went mm. on to work for industry partners. The Gator Radar. Mm. It's doing everything we asked and then some. Naval strike missile, uh, out of Raytheon, you know, you, you name it. So I think the, the more industry can realize our operational necessity is to be naval in character, come from and return to the sea on small shipping, meaning a, a large L-class uh, amphib, of which we need 31, onto uh, some form of shore-to-shore -shore or ship-to-shore connector, mm -hmm. LCAC, LCU, uh, or 53, CH-53K by the air. Those are still relatively small form factor things, so I cannot have things like a 72-ton tank because I can't get it to the point of use on time. I can't do it. Small form factor is key. And it has to be low signature. It has to be low signature. I think one of the things that uh, we experience a lot, so we talked a little bit about Congress uh, industry, but I think there's another uh, part in there, too, that we don't speak a whole lot to, and that's academia, yeah. uh, because our labs spend a lot of time uh, with some of these research universities doing some, some phenomenal stuff. Have you had an opportunity to, to visit any schools? So a couple. Maybe go back to your Aggies and... Uh, Find out what they're doing down there, if they're doing anything for us. After, after they beat uh, Alabama, I was pretty excited <laughs> to go back down. So, yeah, they have a place called the Relis Campus. Mm -hmm. And give the Army a lot of credit here, their Futures Command. They've invested in the Relis Campus, which is a, a, a research and development arm at Texas A&M right, University. Right. They're doing some pretty good stuff in robotics, uh, UAVs. There's also other places. There's uh, uh, UARCs, FFRDCs, federally funded mm -hmm. research uh, development uh, centers such as Johns Hopkins. We work with Johns Hopkins now. 
well, always do, do some contracting. Guys at Systems Command, guys at um, Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, and then also at the uh, Capabilities Development Directorate are working with universities, think tanks, to try to, to first think your way through a problem and then have other people use what's called IRAD, uh, Internal Research and right, Development Money, right. meaning other people's money, not my money, to develop things that we need. Um, there's a concept now that the Marine Corps Forces Reserve, because we're a total force, we're not mm -hmm. reserves and active, but, but they do fall under the command of Marine Force Reserve. It's called an MIU, Marine Innovation Unit. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're, we're debate not debating, but we're deciding where to put that. And these are Marine reservists who already have those ties to right. academia, which includes Naval Post Graduate School. And how do we use a small unit to connect to Boston University, to UPenn, uh, to MIT? We have people with those connections. We just need to pull them into one spot. And this MIU, Marine Innovation Unit, combined with uh, the PhD students, we have a handful Marine officers with PhDs, God forbid, who are <laughs> coming out of um, the Naval Postgraduate School, they're going to be our conduit, along with CISCOM, mm -hmm. out to industry and academia to accelerate uh, innovation. Because, again, if, if you are not, it's like watching uh, the Ricky Bobby thing. If you're not first, you're last. Uh, if you are not accelerating, you are behind. The it, people don't get the patient threat. They're, China is moving, and they are a threat. They're, they're called out as one in the last two NDSs because they do have nefarious designs on the free and open Indo-Pacific where everything we consume and use comes from. So, so you keep talking about accelerating. I just want to ask yeah. you this question because I, I know from personal experience, having supported some of the, the efforts that uh, CD and I, CDD had, had done in the past, you've been running the last, at least from my experience, that I've observed you the last two years in in very high gear. I didn't think you had any more gears, but <laughs> apparently you found some more gears. So I got one gear left. I was what saving it going? for retirement, but you, you're saving that one. I, I was. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm in it now. Um, uh, what keeps you going? So, the, well, I think what keeps you going is there's an obligation. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay, I'll I'll say it. Um, I got two pictures. The only two pictures I keep in my office. The one on the right, and I know we're on the radio, you can't see it. The one on the right is me with my two kids at Camp Lejeune when they were literally, you can see, knee-high. <laughs> uh, that The one who's knee-high on the right is my son, who's a Marine now. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a first lieutenant um, and bigger than me. And on the left is my daughter who gets married next month. So that's the, hey, don't forget to do family stuff and, and go home and enjoy your family because time is fleeting. Right. Picture on the left is uh, Michelle Maloney. That is at a posthumous Bronze Star ceremony for her husband, John, who was my Charlie Company commander uh, in Ramadi, uh, one of two company commanders uh, who was killed uh, underneath me, John Maloney and a guy named Jamie Edge, phenomenal officers. That's his son, Nathaniel, and their daughter, McKenna, who's a, literally a baby, is behind her mom. You can't see her. So every time I'm complaining that, you know, I'm working hard, life is difficult, I think, man, John Maloney would, you should shut up because John Maloney <laughs> would take your place right now and be happy to do it. So that's what keeps you going. That's why you keep the two pictures. One, I got a family. I got skin in the game. I got a son who's a Marine. But I look at, uh, at Michelle Maloney and think, you really don't have a right to complain because I'm sitting here. You should work hard while you're sitting here. Uh, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Hey, finally, I mean, the world's a complex place. There could be a lot of rough seas ahead. What's your advice for young Marines, old Marines, all Marines out there as they see this transformation and transition uh, of the Marine Corps, this sure. this growth and involvement of our Corps. Yeah. <laughs> One is, is hey, Marines aren't afraid of anything, right? So so do not be afraid and, and do not listen. I'll be very candid here. Don't listen to, hey, the old Corps is dead. You know, <laughs> the, uh, we're, we're changing too much. I put it in a proceedings article. Well, I think you came in on the old Corps. And, uh, exactly. You know, and, and, There's a Lance Corporal in 1776 <laughs> who was complaining about how much the Corps changed since the, since uh, yeah. he enlisted in Tun Tavern. The new guys had it easy. Yeah. <laughs> so do, do not be afraid of change. And don't be afraid of failure. Are we going to try things that are going to fail? Well, yes. That's how you know it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So... There's, there's that. Don't be afraid of making changes, bold changes. Don't, don't do incremental. And the other thing is, whether you're an officer or you're an enlisted Marine, the things that you learn at officer candidate school and at recruit training, 40 inches back to front, you know, uh, doing proper drill. People think, oh, my God, he's talking drill. Um, when's he going to talk about war fighting? <laughs> hey, hey, let me tell you, that is war fighting. Yeah. Attention to detail and discipline are the things that will keep you alive in combat. And so the, the traditions 
the customs, the courtesies that make us unique as a core. Do not lose that. Don't think that wearing your uniform properly, saluting properly, rendering the appropriate greeting of the day, that that's some admin stuff. That is war fighting. Mm -hmm. Because the discipline that requires you to make sure that your web belt is two to four inches and not four and a quarter inches, that your ribbons are an eighth of an inch up, not a half inch up, is the same discipline that caused you to check and rotate your magazines, that caused you to make sure that your pintle and T&E on your machine gun are appropriately set, to make sure that your final attack heading in your aircraft is exactly 272, mm -hmm. if that's what it's called for. The attention to detail and the strict discipline you learned at boot camp and the spit and polish, if you will, of being a Marine, don't lose that. And don't let, you know, some salty first lieutenant or salty Lance Corporal tell you that, ah, that's all, you know, spit and polish garrison stuff. Because what you learn in garrison, room inspections, you pick it, does keep you alive in combat. And I've been there a few times, so I think mm -hmm. I know what I'm talking about. Don't lose the, the tie to our his history of customs, courtesies, tradition, spit, polish, that, that is who we are. That's what makes us different as a service. And it's been said many times before, America doesn't need a Marine Corps, America wants a Marine Corps. So you better make sure that, that America still wants one by doing the right things, looking and acting like Marines. So I'll, I'll, I'll share a little secret. So 40 years ago this year, I stepped on the yellow footprints and I'll tell you to this day, I'm still checking my gig line. Absolutely. And I make sure, you know, so I, I couldn't agree with you more, sir. Sir, it's I, it, it it's is. It is. Uh, sir, I just want to uh, say thank you once again for, sure. for making the time to uh, share some of your thoughts with us, talking about the things uh, that our core is evolving to. Some great things on the horizon. These are exciting times. So look forward to seeing all the things coming down the pike. But before I let you go, there's something we normally do here on the show here, and it's called our lightning round. So are you ready for a couple of tough questions? All right, here we go. Ready to go. All right. All right. I will tell you, normally the first question I ask Marines is what's their favorite duty station, but you are the assistant commandant now. I can so tell I, you. Well, I don't want you to be biased, I'm good. but if you want to tell us. Okinawa. Otherwise, Okinawa. Hands down, Okinawa. Oh, okay, so I don't. I don't have to. If ask you don't have you. orders to Okinawa, ask for them. And I'm not just <laughs> saying that because trust me, best kept secret in the Pacific. Spent a little time there myself. <laughs> it's it is not your dad's Okinawa. Trust me. If you're not in Okinawa, you're in the wrong place. Uh, well, thank you for that. So I, I I guess there it is. I thought I thought you were going to say California, Camp no. Pendleton, no. West Coast. Okinawa. What's a TV show, book, movie, or a podcast you'd recommend? If I was reading a book right now, I'd read For Country and Corps. It's a, a biography of O.P. Smith mm -hmm. and, and his life, uh, written by his granddaughter. Phenomenal book for Country and Corps. Um, okay. It's just, it's a terrific book. And uh, uh, inspirational leader and, and his, his work in preparation for what happened in Korea at the Chosen Reservoir is years in the making. So I would recommend that book to anybody. Well, thank you. My, I know my producer's taking notes because every time I turn around, she's handing me a new book to read. So uh, it's a true story. If you weren't a Marine, what would you be doing? What I would want to do is be a <laughs> professional fisherman. Gotcha. Um, but in all candor, my dad was an Army officer. Okay. Uh, so if there was no Marine Corps, I would be serving somewhere in, in one of the other services. Um, but there's going to be another Marine Corps because Marines are going to do exactly what I'm asking them to do, which is uh, is act and look and conduct themselves like Marines. Absolutely. All the way up through the objective, meaning, you know, fight like devil mm -hmm. dogs. So. Hoorah. So, one last question. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? <laughs> if I could have any superpower, it would be a lot more patience. So That's a good one. So, I would have more patience. I'm a pretty patient guy. I'm a gardener and a fisherman, so I, I, have, I have patience. So, you have outlets to I do those. Yeah. Outlets. But I'd be more patient uh, with many things. But unfortunately, the patience in this job sometimes don't go hand in hand because uh, you're trying to get things done on a timeline, not because I'm on a timeline, mm -hmm but because the adversary is on a timeline. Um, but I would, I would try to have more patience. Well, sir, again, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate the conversation, your openness, your insight to uh, a little bit of what's going on up here at the higher headquarters, and I'm sure our listeners appreciate it. So with that, thank you so much for making the time. Continued success. And from my personal level, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, hoorah, sir. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Well, this concludes another episode of Equipping the Corps. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. If so, please take a couple minutes, leave us a review, subscribe, tell your friends about us. Till next time, Manny Pacheco signing off.